Do I clap as well? You sure. want? Yeah. Spike Cohen, the vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. We're at the convention. Welcome. Um, we have never met before, but it turns out we have some common history here. And, and I want to get into the, the party and the message and the values and, and, and let you give a, a sales pitch basically to anybody that's liberty curious watching this um, that doesn't know you or doesn't know about the Libertarian Party. But, uh, you know, what's your, let's start with like, what's your elevator pitch when someone in, in, in an elevator says, so what are you all about? So I say libertarianism is the belief that we own ourselves. And if we own ourselves, that means we own our lives and our bodies. And if we own our lives and our bodies, that means we own our labor, which means that we own the product of our labor, which is our property. And we as libertarians believe that society is best worked out when people respect each other's self-ownership. When we start aggressing against each other, when we start harming people, taking their things and so forth, that's when bad things happen. It's not just wrong from a moral standpoint to take from each other. It's bad from a utilitarian standpoint. If I can take from you and everyone else watching this and listening whenever I see fit, I'm not gonna be a good steward of what I have. I'm not gonna make good choices because I can just take more whenever I want. And you aren't necessarily gonna make the best choices because you know I can come and take it at any given time. And if you look at the bad uh, political policies of the Republicans and Democrats, it's really just a system whereby they have claimed the exclusive authority to take from us as they see fit. And libertarians wanna dismantle that in favor of allowing more free market interactions. Uh, I think I saw you say this, but uh, it's definitely been a theme here at the Libertarian Convention that for all of the supposed differences between Republicans and Democrats, it seems like no matter who's in office, we get the same stuff. We get lots of spending. We get lots of violations yeah. of our civil liberties. The wars don't seem to Absolutely. end. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between Republicans and Democrats? So there's two things there. One is the Republicans and Democrat voters. There's not a huge difference between them either because they all have the same fears and concerns and hopes and dreams and anxieties and everything else. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not much difference between Republican and Democrat politicians either. The Republicrats, in my mind, are one party. They are a party that will give you endless war, endless debt, endless taxation, endless spending, endless putting people in cages for victimless commerce, uh, and really just endless bad, inequitable, and harmful outcomes. The things that we would expect from a policy built around aggression against each other. And so, you know, the reason that there's so much division in this country right now is because Republican and Democrat politicians have to create theater. They have to make people hate each other. They have to make this illusion that if you don't vote for Joe Biden, then you're voting for a Nazi. If you don't vote for Donald Trump, you're voting for a far left communist. When the reality is, if people were able to take a step back and see past the theater and see what's actually happening, Joe Biden and Donald Trump's policies have very little daylight between them. Past the rhetoric, they're both promising you the same thing. More government, more spending, more taxation, more infringements on your rights, more tyranny. So you, you mentioned that the American people really really aren't so different uh, regardless of their, their political affiliation. What does the Libertarian Party have to offer that's different than this, the, the Republicrats, as you say? We put the power back in your hands. For the last 160, actually over 160 years, the Republicans and Democrats have had exclusive control of every lever of power in government, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level as well, for 160 plus years. And what have they done with that? They have taken the power from us, they've taken the rights from us to give to themselves and the well-heeled billionaire cronies that have bought and paid for them and put them in office. And so they've created this system of patronage, this kleptocracy, a government of, by, and for theft. Not just theft of our property and our, and our money, but theft of our rights, theft of our power, theft of our ability to thrive because they wanna keep us in a bad situation. They wanna keep us as dependent and anxious and hopeless and, and fearful as possible. And so what libertarians propose is ending all of that, is putting the power back in your hands. Something I say a lot in this campaign trail is you are the power. The power belongs to you, and it was wrongfully taken from you by politicians, and we seek to give it back to you. So I was watching a podcast that, that I think you were doing with We Are Libertarians, mm -hmm. and, and you, you have um, quite a checkered past. You, you were a conservative at, at one point. Yes. My, my, oh man, the skeletons are out now already, yes. Uh, I was actually a neocon, so I was the worst iteration of a conservative. Yes. I was a neocon, we have to, in my defense, I was 19 years old, 9-11 happened. I was horrified, I was scared. Is this gonna happen every day now? And I'm watching the media, I'm watching 
the, the government, I'm watching all of this stuff, I'm getting all the signals I'm getting are that the reason we were attacked is because we are so free that there are people on the other side of the planet who hate us because we're so free. Look at how free we are. They want us to be subjected to their, you know, their radical, you know, religious uh, uh, theocracy that they want to create. And we have to go and counter that. We have to fight good, evil with good and, and spread uh, liberty and freedom through endless bombing campaigns. It sounds ridiculous now saying it, but that, I believed it. I was, I was that true believer. I was the one saying we needed to use nuclear weapons if they don't give up Al-Qaeda. And when I was told things like, well, the U.S. government created the Mujahideen, which is what was Al-Qaeda, I would say, well, yeah, but that doesn't matter now because now we got to fight evil. And, and it took some, some very uh, annoying people uh, like Ron Paul and this guy named Matt Kibbe, uh, who would keep saying that, no, you know, it's, it, this is blowback from 9-11. This is, we can't, you can't fight your way to peace. And, we, and the, the, the U.S. government created a lot of these problems with a, with a decades-long strategy of using the Middle East as a chessboard uh, for the most cynical of reasons. And, and, and it took me a while to realize that. It took a few years of seeing every prediction that libertarians made coming true in real time for me to realize, uh-oh, I'm wrong, they're right, which is very humbling because I don't like admitting that I'm wrong ever. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can see the pain <laughs> on your face right now. You know, there's, um, it, it strikes me, and I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, communicating with conservatives, and you know, when I, when I um, sort of parse the labels, how we all identify ourselves and our tribes, mm -hmm. is I think there's a lot of common ground between constitutional conservatives and classical liberals and libertarians. Um, and, and one of the arguments, I mean, there's, there's a lot of arguments for this uh, um, against the sort of neoconservative view, and one is just, how many trillions of dollars we spend? Um, this 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 destroys countries. Yeah. It, it, so we are w w up to what twenty eight trillion dollars, uh, and all of this exists, by the way, because of the Fed. The American people would never agree to be taxed 75, 80% tax rates to fund endless wars around the world, this, this spreading of an American empire that really only serves uh, military contractors, uh, uh, warmongering politicians, and foreign dictators. For the most part, that's really the only people that are ahead. We would never agree to be, to, to, to be taxed to pay for that, or the war on drugs, or, or the, 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 the prison to police complex, or any of the things that have been built around a centrally planned system of, of as I call it, kleptocracy, where we are being robbed to pay for powerful people to be more and more powerful at our direct expense. So instead, they have the Federal Reserve print out endless reams of money and lend it to the government in the form of buying treasury bonds every single day a new set of 40-year bonds that are having to be paid off by us and our next two or three generations after us. And of course, by inflating the monetary supply, that makes the value of our currency go down, which is why inflation uh, continues every single year. When the, ever since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, two things happened. One, the next year we went to war, and we have, for the most part, not stopped since. And two, the cost of living has generally and, and gradually risen up to the point where now our money is worth two cents on the dollar what it was in 1913. Imagine if your money was worth 50 times more what it's worth now. No wonder we're in the situation we're in. And it's, it's such a regressive tax because it, it hits people whose uh, savings and salaries are in cash as opposed to really wealthy, smart people who know how to shuffle the decks exactly. of the, the cards in ride the deck. The, ride the, the boom and bust cycles yeah. and all that, yep. Um, but yeah, you're, you're, you're letting your Ron Paul come out right now. <laughs> So, so just to be on record, you think we should end the Fed? Oh, we should end the Fed and replace it with free market banking. Yeah. Imagine if your currency, instead of being issued by a, an organization who has a vested interest in reducing the value of your dollar, not just to reduce the value of the debt that they're running up, but also to keep you desperate, to keep you reliant on them. Imagine if instead your currency was being provided by competing providers who had a vested interest not in reducing its value, but actually increasing its value or at least retaining its value because they want you to use their currency instead of someone else's and actually get a piece of it as a result of that. Imagine if the cost of living went down slowly over time or, or at least didn't go up. And this, by the way, this speaks to a greater thing here, Matt. There are two ways you can get something, through competition and through coercion. And so with competition, you have people who have a vested interest because they know they don't have your business guaranteed. They are competing and, and to get, you know, they want to be the one that gets your business. If it's through coercion, through a monopoly, they don't have to compete. They can just give you whatever service that they want to. And if it's really bad, then that's what you get. So I, I've used this um I have this theory, and I want to float it past you and, okay. and, and get your reaction, because, because in a lot of ways, um, and, and not superficial ways, but at, at, a, at a sort of a messaging level, 
I, I see a lot of similarities between Bernie Sanders and Ron Paul. Absolutely. And they're both raging against the machine. They're, they're raging against insiders gaming the system. They're against permanent war. They're against mass surveillance. They're against mass incarceration. Uh, they're against crony capitalism. And, and I think in a lot of ways, uh, uh, young people that are attracted to, to Bernie and maybe AOC as well, mm -hmm. um, they're attracted to those value propositions that we're getting screwed by, by people that are gaming the system. And yet, um, only libertarians have the answer to that, which is decentralized power. Yeah, I agree with that. I, one of the things that, that got me the nomination for the Libertarian Party vice presidency is to show that uh, I was able to bring people in from the left. And the way I did that was I recognized that these aren't ideological socialists who want to you know, uh, seize the means of production and all of that. Most of them are scared. Same thing on people on the right. Most people, voters, non-voters, most people right now are scared. What if I end up in an emergency room and it ruins me financially for decades? What if I end up with a, a chronic illness and I'm never, and I end up dying because I can't afford the care? What if I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student debt and I can't get a job in my chosen field of study, or even if I can, I end up just paying off the debt for the rest of my life? And when they speak to people who are in older generations, they're told, well, you know, when I was in going to school, I just paid my way through it. And then I bought a house a few years later. Well, that's not how it works now. And so when someone like Bernie Sanders or AOC shows up and says, look at these people, they're, they're, they, they took everything from you. They, they put this debt on you. They put these policies on you. We're going to go and tax them and give you what you deserve. That is a, I mean, it's a, it is a value proposition and it's a survival proposition. It's, it's, you're going to thrive through us taxing the people who created this system. It's a revenge proposition, but it's built around the idea that you have a, a, a right. We, we get into what rights are or not, but they consider it a right to be able to have the things they need to thrive. Well, we believe that they have that right as well. We just recognize that the organization that created that, that created that, that uh, arrangement where they're now so desperate that they need more help, is not the arrangement. I don't want the people who put, a, put me in a terrible situation to now be the ones to decide if I get health care or not. And so it, once you start that conversation with them and you empathize with them and meet them where they are, and you validate their concerns, you can then take them on that journey and show them how libertarianism is the way. Because the, the, the contradiction is that all of those value propositions, all of those, those moral outrages are created by abuse of monopoly government power. I mean, where does mass incarceration comes from? It comes from the state. Exactly. And, and so to me, I, I have the same optimism that, and I'm not trying to convince either Bernie or AOC that they're wrong because I think they're, they're pretty invested in their own beliefs, but we're not talking to them. We're talking to people that are trying to figure stuff out. Absolutely. I, I remember uh, with the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street uh, were happening around the same time. And the Tea Party was focused on big government and Occupy Wall Street was focused on big business, the, the, the major crony corporations and so forth. And their talking points were largely the same. And whether they recognized it or not, they were fighting the same monster, and yet they hated each other. What a perfect example of how Republicans and Democrats, the Republicans, divide people against each other. These people hated each other. I mean, they would fight in the streets, and yet they were fighting the same beast. If they took that step back and realized, oh, at the top, they're all working together, I, I believe then they'd, they'd come to libertarianism, because we're the only ones who are consistently saying big government and the cronies that have been built around this system of patronage that the Republicans have created, they were the problem. As, as someone who was involved in the Tea Party, I always say that, that politics ultimately corrupted a social movement that was built around a shared set of values. On both and, sides. On both sides. Yep. And the same with Occupy Wall Street. And, and in the case of the Tea Party, the, the Republican machine came in and, and um, demanded of them that they just support a slate of candidates instead of a, a slate of values that may be reflected by some candidates. Exactly. Occupy Wall Street within days was replaced by, I mean, I remember early Occupy, a lot of Ron Paul kids in that crowd. Mm -hmm. And then the Marxists came in and, and, and imposed over top of that an ideology that, that was just anti-capitalism, not anti-crony capitalism. Right, right. And I, I see that, um, I, I see how controversial this is um, here at the Libertarian Convention. Um, uh, you know, our opinion about Black Lives Matter and, and my take on this. Yep. I mean, when I first heard that phrase, I, my knee-jerk reaction was, no, all, all lives matter. And it wasn't until I was able to talk to um, some Black Lives Matter activists from Ferguson, 
who explained to me that what they were trying to say was that black lives matter don't matter enough when it comes to the equal enforcement of our laws and our criminal justice system. Yep. And I'm like 100% in agreement with that, and, and we all agree with that. But there is, there does seem to be a, a fundamental difference between um, some of the early leaders of Black Lives Matter who, who openly say, I'm a radical Marxist, versus people that are marching in the streets just wanting the government to stop targeting people just because of the color of their skin. Oh, the movement has completely, it's like you said, it started as a largely a college student movement um, that was built around a Marxist set of ideals. Over time, it has become people saying, like you just said, if we want to be able to say that all lives matter, we have to show that black lives matter. We have to change the disproportionate use of harm uh, and force uh, against communities of color and other marginalized communities, or we can't honestly say that all lives matter in the eyes of the government, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of how people are being treated uh, societally. We have to be able to change that. You talked uh, in your speech yesterday, you talked a lot about um, the cause of equal justice and, and militarized police. Um, what, what's your take on all that? Oh, I mean, we don't have enough time for my entire take on most things actually, but I, I think the short, the long and short of it is the biggest single problem is police aren't being held accountable. And that's why I'm glad that Libertarian Congressman Justin Amash uh, has created a, tri has put together tripartisan legislature. I love that we were able to say tripartisan now, that's a thing now. Uh, tripartisan legislature, uh, legislator, legislation to end qualified immunity. Uh, and for those who don't know what qualified immunity is, essentially, imagine if you could go into a courtroom and say, Your Honor, I know that I'm being tried for murder, uh, but I think what I did was perfectly reasonable. And the judge goes, oh, okay, well, if you're being tried, if you, if you think it was reasonable, then I'll just throw the charges out. That's essentially what qualified immunity is. And I, we could spend an hour plus talking about what it is. But the breakdown is it creates a system where Derek Chauvin, who murdered George Floyd, which sparked these protests, he had 17 other complaints against him, including wrongful death complaints. He may have murdered other people. And the Minneapolis Police Department, when they looked at Derek Chauvin, they did the same thing that police departments around the country do when they look at the bad apples in their bunch. They said, this cop is terrible. He's out here killing people. He's out here doing all sorts of damage and infringing on people's rights. But if we try to fire him, we're going to have to fight the police unions. And it's going to cost us an absolute fortune. And he's not really cost, costing us anything staying on the force because of qualified immunity. We, we can't get sued, and neither can he. So we'll just keep him on. He'll eventually commit a crime, and we can, you know, we can get rid of him then. That's why this ended up happening. All of the other problems that happen, if, uh, if police and, and government officials were held accountable for, for the infringements that they do on the lives and constitutional rights of people, uh, then that would create a flip of that. So now the police departments would look at a Derek Chauvin and say, we got to get rid of this guy the first time he had a problem because we don't want to get sued. And the police unions, who also don't want to have to pay off all those lawsuits, would be doing the same thing. So you would now have them actively rooting out bad police, not just uh, you know, once they do something, but even before they in enter the force. So that would incentivize good policing and punish bad policing and help heal that rift between the police and the public, especially the most marginalized among us. So it, it, it's interesting the, the the contradictions on both sides of the ideological spectrum. Oh, yeah. And I don't really buy the left right thing, but um, conservatives, when they hear your argument that you just made, they're they're going to hashtag the shit out of you. They're going to say blue lives matter, and they're going to argue that that's not really a problem. And what's interesting about that is conservatives very much understand that power corrupts, and and their ideology is limited government because. You can't trust um, unchecked bureaucrats with unlimited power. Exactly. And they would say that about the EPA. They'd say that about the Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to law enforcement, the actual people enforcing it now, they have, a, now they you have, have to comply. They have their blinders comply, on. Yeah. And and the other the other half of that, I'll, I'll pick on the left for a little bit because um, if they really want to take on police accountability they have to do something about public unions. Yep. And that's a, that's a contradiction for them because they believe that, that special privileges for government workers is an essential part of the, the sort of progressive mission. We have to protect them yep. from accountability for the people. Um, and so they have their blinders on, and it goes back to the theater you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing something like Justin Amash's bill on qualified immunity, instead of actually structural reform, 
Um, they got everybody yelling at everybody, and, and I'm not sure that anything real is going to happen this year. It's, and it, unfortunately, because there aren't enough libertarians in office, because again, the Republicans and Democrats have a vested interest in A, allowing problems to continue, B, if at all possible, making those problems worse, and C, making sure that everyone stays nice and hateful of each other as a result of it. So a perfect example, another thing that, that progressives could use some help on is the fact that they often want to keep creating more and more laws. Eric Garner wasn't murdered because the cops just walked up to him and said, hey, I want to murder you. That whole interaction started because he was selling loose cigarettes without collecting taxes. So the, in, this was an example where a, a, essentially a victimless crime, selling tobacco without uh, you know, collecting taxes or having a license to sell tobacco, resulted in someone being murdered, choked to death in front of people. Um, and so we need to look at the reality that when you keep creating laws, uh, that you're just creating more opportunities for interactions between armed people who have the authority to use whatever level of force to bring people into compliance and the public that they have to do that to. So that's something we'll look at there. What a great opportunity we have though, Matt. The Republicans and Democrats have built their entire system around keeping America entirely divided. We as libertarians want the opposite. We want to bring people together and people naturally want that. So here I or you or someone else can come in, we can come in, empathize with them, meet them where they are, uh, demonstrate that we're listening to them, identify their concerns, and then take them on the journey to unifying everyone behind what we all recognize, that we are free, we should have the power, and we should take that power back from them. And once we realize that it's not Republicans versus Democrats or conservatives versus or progressives, it's the state and its machinations versus us, then we are able to actually unify people and bring them together. So the, um, it does feel like that opportunity is there, and I feel like, I, I've felt like it's been there for a while, and the, the, the hyper-tribalism where um, the, the, the current Republican Party and the current Democratic Party seem almost exclusively based on what they hate about the other guys. Mm -hmm. and, and Trump very much represents this. He, he, he won just as a response to, to, to the things that Republicans Oh, he's embraced want. it. He has embraced the concept of, you don't even have to like my policies, I just hit the left and, ma and it makes them cry and you like it. Yeah. And I got news for you. The Democrats are gonna come up with their guy that does that too, or their, or their lady who does that too. AOC is kind of that to a lesser extent. Someone who, you like her policies, you don't like her policies, she hits the right and makes them cry. And that's the problem. If we are voting for people with terrible, abusive ideas that we otherwise would hate because they make people that we've been told to dislike cry when they say things, that's a problem. We're now engaging in theater that harms all of us. So you can see, um, maybe not so much in big L libertarian party registration. I don't actually know what that data is, but I do know that fewer and fewer young people are registering as Republicans or Democrats. Um, they're, they're independents. And, and I never really thought of, of libertarianism as in the middle between these two extreme tribes, but let's, let's use it as a, a metaphor. They're pushing people out, and they're pushing people to the center, yeah. and you think we can get them. How does the Libertarian Party attract those votes that are sort of alienated by all the anger and the hate? They're already coming to us, Matt. The young people are defined by two large things. One, they don't really like authority. Authority. They have been raised on a combination of seeing how authority has completely screwed them and their entire generation over. Uh, and then they've also been raised on uh, uh, media that has popularized resisting authority. Uh, and then they're also huge about culture. If you see the Me Too movement, if you see how everything now on websites you have to uh, click to consent, people are choosing things, uh, they want a la carte everything, they don't want anything forced on them, large or small, libertarianism is built around resisting presumed authority just for the sake of it. We're built around the idea that the only thing that, that separates uh, something that is a just or unjust transaction is whether or not there was consent involved. And so what a perfect opportunity for us to reach these kids. And it sometimes takes us getting over ourselves because we'll sometimes look at someone and go, oh, they're just some bootlicking Republican or, or oh, they're just some you know, Trump supporter or oh, they're just some commie liberal. And the thing is, no, especially if you're talking about younger, younger people, this is someone who was a kid a couple years ago 
and they've been thrust into a world and a system that was not made for them and they are acutely aware of it. And what an awesome opportunity for us to meet them where they are, not just in their spaces, but from their precepts. And this is something I learned from 20 years of, of, of running a business and, and doing sales and communications and, and leadership skills and doing that. You meet people where they are, you identify their problems, you demonstrate that you're someone who actually cares and is listening to them, and then you can take them on that journey. You can take them in many journeys. Bernie Sanders has taken them on a journey. AOC, to some extent, Trump has taken them on a journey. You have to meet them where they are, you have to demonstrate you care, and then you can take them to the journey. And our journey is to setting people free and giving them their power back. So is, is, is young people where the Libertarian Party thrives? I, I, I don't think we should leave any, uh, any chips on the table. It's, it's where I am primarily going to. Um, I am the first uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an old millennial, I'm 38, but I'm the first millennial on a major presidential ticket, and it's looking like, based on who uh, Biden is likely to pick, that I will be the only one. Um, but more so than just me being young, because Bernie Sanders is, is you know, one of the oldest to run, and he very much spoke to millennials uh, and, to, and Gen Z people. Um, our outreach is, again, demonstrating to them that we're the only ones who recognize what it is they're going through. And not just recognize what they're going through, but why it has happened, and how to get out of it. And that doubling and tripling and quadrupling down on the same failed centrally planned ideas is not going to lead to anything more than even more harmful and inequitable and abusive outcomes because of course it would. It is a monopoly of violence that is built around growing the strength of cronies and politicians and bureaucrats. How on earth would it lead to anything but bad outcomes for those who don't have that power? So there was a time in 2016 at the height of the peak of Gary Johnson's campaign that a lot of polling was showing that he was actually pretty much tied with Hillary on the youth vote. And you know, a lot of things happened, and I, th I think one of the things that happened is the media um, flipped from being very sympathetic to Gary because they thought he was stealing Republican yep, votes. Yep. And once that happened, the media got quite hostile, and, and Gary put his foot in his mouth a couple times. And, and, and I say this as someone that was working on a super PAC, specifically trying to get young people to show up and vote. And what happened as you got closer and closer to the election, Gary was kept off the stage. Um, there was all sorts of shenanigans by the two parties to, to um, kind of keep the libertarian option out of the media. And a lot of young people, and they were quoted in an article after article, said, I would vote libertarian, but what's the point? I'm just going to stay home. How, and this is, a, this is a fundamental dilemma for third parties trying to break in. It's kind of a chicken you're and egg. Throwing your vote away. Yeah, you're throwing your how, vote away. How could you throw your vote away? So I argue that a vote thrown away is voting for the same people and the same parties who created this problem and made it worse. And now they're coming to you and saying, well, yeah, no, I created the problem, but this time, folks, I got a deal for you. If you vote for me one more time, I'm totally going to fix all of this. I haven't fixed it up until this point, and I'm not fixing it now, and I'm still actively making it worse. But, again, vote for me now, totally going to fix it. That's a vote thrown away, Matt. It's a, the only thing that your vote is worth is to try to change and to try to make an actual change to an ever-worsening situation. And if we know that Democrats and Republicans have had exclusive control of the thing and just keep making it worse, then whatever the polling is, the only viable option for your vote is a radical departure from that non-changing, ever-worsening system that both parties, both major parties are proposing. So we've been talking a, a lot about, um, about the message, and uh, I'd like to take a step back and learn a little bit more about you so that people can figure out who this crazy man is that we're talking to. This crazy man, yeah. You, uh, you mentioned Ron Paul, and, and you mentioned me, and you mentioned that you started off as a neoconservative. What was your path to libertarianism? Well, and I kind of gave the, the long and short of that already. It, it, was, it was two things. Watching what I was talking, you know, watching you and, and Ron Paul and others explain why neocon was just wrong. And I, I went straight from neocon very quickly went through, you know, uh, I guess conservative paleocon type and, and even constitutionalist straight into like libertarianism. Um, but the other thing that was happening was uh, I started a, a web design company uh, right after my seven, right before my 17th birthday in 1999. 
And I grew it into a, it was growing into a fairly successful company each year as it was that much more successful. I watch what government does to companies that are successful, not multi-billion dollar companies that are able to leverage their power to use government as a bludgeon against anyone that would want to compete against them and, and to basically uh, uh, entrench their market share, but companies that are trying to work their way up through all those barriers and burdens that the politicians and cronies have created specifically to keep us down, specifically to keep us from disrupting and innovating and threatening their precious market share. They just make it harder. More taxes, more regulation, more oversight, more taxes, more regulations, more oversight. And I was providing web design services. I was providing a value to people. I was helping businesses grow. I was essentially helping startups become successful businesses in their own right. What was I doing to deserve this kind of treatment? I was being treated like someone who was engaging in criminal activity, and I, and I wasn't. And so that, that coupled with watching uh, you know, my whole neocon fantasy unravel before me really made me realize government is not here to help us. Government isn't even necessarily here in its current configuration to arbitrate between us. Government has been set up by the Republicrats and their cronies to rob us in every aspect, our power, our lives, our rights, our property, to feed themselves. That's why we see the growing income inequality. That's why we see the growing gap between those with the most and those with the least. That's why we see a relative handful of people that own almost all of the effective wealth in this country and even around the world, because that's the way the system is set up. We are in free market capitalism, and it, it, it's a cynical lie when they say that. And both sides say that. Both sides have a vested interest in saying that we're in free market capitalism. We're not in free market capitalism. We're in corporatism. And corporatism is the economic plank of fascism. So what, uh, you're, you're, you're focused on culture and message and particularly reaching young people who, mm. who I call them liberty curious. They don't, they don't know that there is this they thing. They don't know they're libertarians yet. They yeah. don't know. Um, and, and you and Joe Jorgensen are now the nominees for president and vice president mm. of the Libertarian Party. Uh, one of your challenges is ballot access, yes. because the the lockdowns from COVID, um, there been a lot of nefarious outcomes of that. But one of them is is the ability of third parties to knock on doors and collect signatures and meet the requirements needed to be on a ballot. And right now, I think the LP is only on uh, 37 states right now. Uh, yeah, I believe 30, 36 or 37 states, yeah. and on the remaining 14 or 13 states. The challenge, as you were saying, is even in the best of conditions, some of these states have, like New York, you essentially have to get over a quarter of a million signatures. Unless you're a Republican or Democrat, then you're automatically on, or you, you pay some kind of you know, nuisance fee to get on. But if you're a third party or an independent, you have, to, you have to get like a quarter of a million signatures to even get on the ballot, which eats up all sorts of money and resources, even in the best of times. In a situation where it's illegal for people to have large gatherings, and illegal for you to knock on people's doors for non-essential purposes, you can't get that many signatures. So we have 13 or 14 states where we're still fighting, and we're suing in all of those states uh, to get ballot access relief, to basically saying, hey, listen, 2016 we qualified. You know why we aren't, you know, why we're having difficulty qualifying this time. We need to get relief. Go ahead and put us on the ballot. And we're actually fighting for other parties as well to be able to get on the ballot. Uh, and if anyone wants to continue looking into that, uh, lp.org slash ballot access gives a constant update as to how we're doing. The, uh, um, the other challenge for the libertarian candidate is always getting on the presidential stage. Yes. And it's, it's, it's still a fundamental problem, even though social media is in somewhat has leveled the playing field. Um, and of course, Gary Johnson, by the standards applied to Ross Perot, easily would have qualified for the stage, but the... the he almost qualified for the new standards, yeah. too. So after Ross Perot was able to get on, that horrified the hell out of everyone in charge. And so they changed it so that now you have to get 15% or more in reputable opinion polls, which apparently they decide what's reputable. Uh, and so you have this debate cartel that's saying you have to get 15% or more in, I, I believe, five or more polls, I think it is. And uh, Gary and Bill in 2016, they got, I believe, 13% in one and 11 in, in two others. So they were within, they were close to getting that. But what's happened in the last four years? We have people in the streets because they're showing record levels of distrust of government. People are not happy with their outcomes. And the other thing that's happened in four years is that the dying TV news media, which does their best to shut us out in every possible way, 
has lost its share of the news market, and social media, where we're much more prevalent, much more able to get our message out, has become has basically taken up all of that uh, share that TV media has lost. So I think we're going to get that 15% in those five polls, and when that happens, you're going to have Joe Biden and Donald Trump, two men who can barely form a coherent sense between them, and who more importantly are emblematic of everything that is wrong with what the Repub Republicans have done with our you know, constitutionally limited republic. And in between them, you'll have Joe Jorgensen, an absolutely brilliant self-made entrepreneur, a woman who's ready to lead from day one, a, 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 a senior lecturer and an accomplished orator who's able to break down point by point and case by case how the Republicans and Democrats have created the mess we're in and how our common sense libertarian solutions are the way out of that mess. Do you guys, um, what is success? You're, you're running, and is success being in the White House, is there something less than winning that is, is, a, is something you can walk away from and say, we got that done? We're running to win. And it is, we are running to win, and we are cognizant of the fact that our high water mark was last, last election, 3.25%. We recognize that we would have to essentially get 10 times that number of votes to really be in contention for the Electoral College. We are running to win. And you know, people will say, how are you going to get that 35%? And the, the, the answer to, from that, to that for, from me is, if we get that 15% to get on that debate stage, I believe it's all over. I believe it will be an emperor has no closed moment. Everyone's told, oh, you know, third parties, it's a waste of your vote, and you're throwing your vote away. And if you're not voting Democrat, you're voting Republican. And if you're not voting Republican, then you're voting Democrat. But if you're voting Libertarian, then you're voting both Democrat and Republican. It's a nonsensical argument, but it works. If we get on that stage and people see not only are we not a vote thrown away, but we're the only option that even begins to make sense up there, then I think we're gonna win the thing. Now, when we dial back to what are other victories, uh, I honestly don't even like getting into that right now because we are running to win. And the last thing I want is for any of the people who are on the ground every single day, uh, making phone calls and getting petitions signed and, and you know, calling in to talk radio and doing their best to get us on interviews and everything else for me to say, well, if we can get X percent, then that'll be a real victory. If you think about it, it'll be a nice moral victory for us. We're running to win. We believe that we will win. Joe Jorgensen, I believe, will be the next president of, of, the, of the United States. And I believe that it will happen on the strength of the American people seeing firsthand how there is no comparison between Joe and the Republicans. Okay, this is the gotcha question. I'm going to close out with this. Okay. And this will either make or ruin your political. Oh career. wow! What well, uh, man? I wish I had had some time to do some <laughs> calisthenics or something. Yeah. Um, has politics eaten your soul yet? Not yet. No, I, 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 <laughs> I um, no, I am enjoying it. When I decided to run for vice president, because as as you know, and, and your audience may not know. Um, we actually pick, our party picks the president and vice president separately. So I actually ran for vice president. And when I decided to run for the nomination, it was on the strength of the idea that I would use this and leverage it to spread the message of liberty far and wide, to reach people who had never really truly heard a message of liberty. Liberty has always been some catchphrase or some you know, a, a, a cynical implementation that has nothing to do with actual liberty. It's just, a, it's just a throwaway term that's being used by major politicians. And I wanted to go in and explain what liberty is, what free markets mean, what people set free and are able to thrive and be able to, 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 to live in ways that we can't even imagine right now. Uh, because we are no longer having to deal with the bad, centrally planned, crony-friendly, arbitrarily defined and abusive policies that have been put in place by the Republicrats. That is what I ran to do, and I'm getting to actually do that. I mean, being able to be interviewed by someone who was a, a, a major in, uh, inspiration for me to even become a libertarian, these things are, are if anything, growing my soul. They're, they're, they're expanding uh, uh, my 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 my. Uh, I don't even know what the word to use. They're, they're, I, I feel sh more alive every single day doing this. Um, and maybe that'll change as things get tighter. I don't know. But this, I am in my, in my glory right now. I'm getting to talk to people about liberty. I'm getting to, and, and no offense to you, as fun as this is, my favorite thing is to go into a hostile audience on a hostile interview. Someone who thinks libertarians are selfish, racist people who only care about themselves and they hate the poor. And by the time it's over, I've demonstrated that we care about them and that we have those solutions. And either I brought them to our side or I've at least planted a seed. If I can do that every day for the rest of my life, then I will live a very, very happy man in the meantime. Very cool. It's been good getting to know you and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate yours as well. 
Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.